All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. It's 6.30 and we don't have any more people coming in. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am really excited to be back in person and see your faces, masked or not. And um, welcome to everyone also watching from home. Um, I think I told everyone, but if you didn't, please go ahead and sign in tonight so we can get a good count. Although I don't think that will be too hard tonight. <laughs> um, and you can also use that form to sign up for our newsletter if you don't already get it. Um, my name is Erin Quinn Balcho, and I am the museum curator for the Lacey Museum. Our speaker tonight on my right is Karen Johnson, and she will be sharing a true crime history mystery full of twists and turns. Before we dive in, I do want to start with a land acknowledgement, and then we'll talk about a little bit of museum news as per usual. The Lacey Museum is on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically Southern Lachutseed speakers, Nisqually and Squaxin Island tribes. We acknowledge and remember not to forget those tribal people that are named, but not recognized today, and who were absorbed into other tribes for survival or were relocated. We recognize the ancestors and their relations that are still here. Lacey and the South Puget Sound region are encompassed by the Treaty of Medicine Creek, signed under duress in 1854. We respect and affirm tribal sovereignty, and as a part of the city of Lacey, we work with the Nisqually and the Squaxin Island tribes in government-to-government -government partnership. All right, on to some museum updates. We'd love to see you at the museum. We are open Thursdays and Fridays, 11 to 3, and Saturdays, 10 to 4. Right now, we've got a temporary exhibit up through the end of this month called 1968, The Year That Rocked Washington, and it is brought to us from Legacy Washington. This exhibit looks back at 1968 and its impact on Washington State through the stories of some remarkable people who lived through it. It's on display at the Lacey Museum, and some of it is here in City Hall. For those of you here, there's a few panels, a couple panels up there in the lobby if you want to take a look. Um, Coming later this fall, we will be hosting a Smithsonian poster exhibit called Journey Stories. It explores how movement has shaped our nation with a look at American expansion and migration from the earliest settlers and Native American displacement to the effects of transportation on modern mobility. We hope you'll come and check it out and get a tour from one of our great volunteer tour guides. Um, I now wanna draw your attention to a new feature that we have on our website called Virtually Lacey. Um, this is going to be a growing repository for information on Lacey and South Sound history. Um, it's still in its infancy and we'd love your help to make it better. Um, when you go to our webpage, um, you'll find it underneath Learn About Lacey's History and there's a form on the page to give any feedback or suggest topics that you might want or you can always just send me an email as well. Um, last week, we dedicated a historic marker that celebrates the lives of local black activists, Nat and Thelma Jackson. It is located on the Karen Frazier Woodland Trail between the Lacey Depot and Woodland Creek Community Park. It's a really beautiful walk if you wanna go and see it, um, but it's also available on our website if you can't or don't wanna make that walk. Um, coming up in Next month's History Talks, we hope you'll join us for um, a talk on the Pig War with former Historical Commission Chair Eric Abel, who is going to share with us the history behind a standoff between the United States and Great Britain in 1859. It all started here in Washington State, it was territory then of course, over the shooting of a wayward pig that had uprooted a neighboring farmer's potatoes bringing the two countries to the brink of war for the third time in less than a century. That program is also planned to be in hybrid format, just like tonight. And um, we would encourage people, if they do have intention to come in person, that they do come in the next time or two because we'll be making the decision about whether to continue in person um, based on our attendance. Um, now for tonight's presentation. We are gonna hold our question and answer session at the end, just like usual. 
Tonight's a bit of an experiment since it's our first hybrid um, presentation. We're gonna do our best to get questions from both our in-person and online attendees. Um, so for those of you who are online, if you have any questions that you can think of during the presentation or after, feel free to submit them on the Q&A button like you normally do, and I will read them out, um, and we'll see how that goes, right? It's an experiment. Um, afterwards, we do have Thurston County Historical Journals for sale. Um, Karen's talk tonight was an in-depth story that she wrote for the journal, and we have copies of that issue if anyone is interested in purchasing those. Now let's introduce her. If you don't already know her, she is an amazing person in local history. She has worked in the museum field since 2001. Are you heckling me? Yes, but quietly. I see. She has written innumerable history articles. It's just going to make me worse. And co-authored two books two amazing, wonderful books that if you haven't bought, you should buy because they're really good. She currently serves as the curator at the Olympia Tumwater Foundation um, and as the editor of the Thurston County Historical Journal. Without her, that journal would not happen, let me tell you. Thank you for being with us tonight. Let me go and switch the slide. Okay, joke. Well, as I mentioned before, thank you for coming tonight. It's so nice to see real faces out there in an audience, but also welcome to anyone who's uh, tuned in on Zoom. So we'll give Aaron a minute to, okay, here we go. Um, so how many of you out there are married or have been married? Yeah, oh, almost everybody. I'm keeping my hand down. Um, this is a story of... There's some online people raising their hand, too, just oh, so you know. <laughs> okay. This is a story of a young lady who got married, and that was a bad point in her life. Um, and there are other people involved in this story, but she's going to be our main character. We're going to try to follow the thread of her life through all uh, the events that really affected her and a bad way. So this is a, a true crime story. Um, if you, hopefully that most weddings are joyful events, but not this one. It led toward an almost inevitable chain of tragedies for Susie, our, um, our heroine, if you want to call her that. She suffered abuse, broken homes, infidelity, murder, abandonment, divorce, a child's death, um, a fatal disease. And most of the men in her life were scoundrels, hence the title of my talk. So the story has a lengthy cast of characters, but the main ones here are Susie Lewis, who is a young Tumwater woman who married Jesse Winkle. Unfortunately, I don't have a photo of Susie. This all happened back in the early 1900s. Um, not many photos. In fact, when I was asked to give this talk, I thought, oh, it worked out fine as an article in writing, but as an illustrated talk. So some of these, like the image you see for Susie Lewis, it's just a generic image of a young woman. It's not her. I have at least one other photo that's just a chosen image that's representative of someone. The rest of the photos in here are real, but Susie I do not have a, a true image of. Um, her husband, Jesse Winkle, who was also a murderer, which we'll learn about, and he murdered Frank Lamp, his brother-in-law. Frank was not only a murder victim, but he was a philanderer. I like that word, philanderer. And he was a good one. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the individual characters. Susie was born in 1885 in Thurston County. Her father, her biological father, was physically abusive to both her and her mother, so her mom divorced her husband on the grounds of cruelty and abandonment. And the mother and daughter continued living in Thurston County after the divorce. A few years later, the mom married a man named Alexander Henry. He was a widower who already had several children from his first marriage, and then um, the, the new or newlyweds eventually had three children of their own. So once Susie joined that growing family, the new blended family, we hope that her childhood was more pleasant. We don't know that for sure, but let's hope that was so. And aside from being named on a few censuses, the um, 
1880 or 1890 census and 1900 census. We don't know much about Susie's early life. She didn't appear again on public records until age 17, and we'll find out in a moment why she appeared. So this is Jesse Henry Winkle, who was her first husband. Jesse was born in 1880 in Oregon, and after his father died, his mother married a man named Byers, and they moved back, the family moved back and forth between Washington and Oregon. Um, the children eventually included Jesse and his full sister, Alice, and then from the new marriage, there are another four daughters and a son. That family eventually moved to Tumwater, but the home wasn't a happy one. In 1903, Jesse's stepfather, Charles Byers, filed for a divorce from his wife. Divorce was not really all that unusual in those days, but a lot of divorced women said that they were widowed just to avoid the stigma. Um, but in his divorce complaint, Byers claimed that his wife, Lucy, had disregarded her marriage vows and took up and became intimate with a certain Italian, that she had frequently said to plaintiff that she hated him and would not live with him, that she hated their children because they looked like him. The judge granted the divorce. <laughs> so Jesse had a, had a rough beginning, too. Uh, Frank William Lamp, the other uh, antagonist, I guess, uh, was born in 1868 in Wisconsin. His family later moved to Minnesota, and sometime after 1882, he relocated to Oregon. Uh, we don't know why or exactly when. Uh, in these early days, it was hard to follow people in, in public records. But in 1895, Frank, who was 27 at the time, married Alice Winkle, who was Jesse Winkle's full sister. And they got married. She was only 18 at the time. They got married in, in Oregon. And that marriage cemented and began the relationship between Frank Lamp and the Winkle slash Byers family. So Frank and Alice first lived in Oregon, and then they moved to Washington. Frank worked at the Olympia Lumber Company and the Olympia Door Company, and he eventually went to work for the Olympia Brewing Company. Um, he and his family lived just a few blocks uphill from the brewery in Tumwater. A news article later said, Lamp was a hard-working man. He was always kind to his family and provided for them bountifully. He was liked by his large circle of acquaintances here. But Frank had a dark side, which we'll find out about. Now, we don't know how Jesse and Susie met, uh, how they got to know each other. But in 1902, they were married in Olympia by a Presbyterian minister. Jesse was 21, and at the time, he was working as a brewer at the brewing company. Susie was only 17, barely had turned 17, and in fact, she had to obtain permission for, from both her parents in order to marry Jesse. So the um, document here on the bottom left is her father's, well, actually, her stepfather's permission for her to marry, and in the middle was her mother's handwritten note letting the uh, minister and the courts know that it was okay with her if her daughter uh, married Jesse. Too bad. Um, by 1904, the couple was living in Port Orchard, and there Susie gave birth to a son who was named James. Now, Jesse had a quick temper, and he was prone to violence at home and elsewhere, too. Soon after the birth of their son, the couple moved to Bremerton, and Jesse's escalating abuse, both of Susie and of the baby, uh, caused her to leave their home for quite a while. And then not long after, perhaps as a reaction to his wife leaving him, Jesse got into a knife fight in a Bremerton saloon, and he uh, cut a man rather badly, and he then fled to Southern California, I assume to avoid arrest. So Susie later joined him there, and again, we have to assume that she did it in hopes of patching up the marriage and at least keeping him as a father for their new baby. They eventually got back together and returned to Olympia, where Jesse went back to work at the brewery. So here's a picture of, you know, this is about 19, late 1905, 06, uh, when the brew house tower, which you can see when you drive on I-5, was just being built. And this view is looking southeast. Um, keep track of those piles of lumber up here on the left side of the photo. We're going to come back to those later. Um, on this side, we have a document from 19, April 1905 that shows a payroll sheet from the brewery, and you see down here highlighted in yellow Jesse's name. So he did. we were able to prove that he did indeed work at the brewery. 
In 1906, Jesse started a fight with another brewery worker, and it was apparently over some something that had happened at a brewery strike uh, the year before. Uh, another brewery employee wrote a friend, a week ago today, Winkle caught Landon up on the Tumwater Bridge and gave him a good walloping. Also, two black eyes, a swelled up nose, and a cut lip. Landon had him arrested, and they will have a trial next Monday. So Jesse did indeed go to court, and he was found guilty of um, assault and battery, but with mitigating circumstances, although the court documents did say exactly what the mitigating circumstances were. He was fined $5, which is about $165 in today's money and court cost. A news article said that Jesse has had several fights with his fellow workers at Tumwater and is considered a dangerous man with a knife. Few of Jesse Winkle's fellow workmen had good words for him. Of a morose disposition, he communicated little of his troubles to a friend, to his friends, and what if any real or imaginary wrongs he may have been brooding over, the future will have to lay bare. So here's a uh, family tree. There's not going to be a quiz at the end, so don't feel that you have to memorize this. But you can see on the left here the Lewis family who had um, Susie. In the middle is the Winkle family. They had Two of their children were Jesse Winkle and his full sister Alice. And then on the far right, we have the Lamp family with Frank. So Susie eventually married Jesse. His sister Alice married Frank. So that makes Jesse and Frank brothers-in-law. So now we come to the crime. And later reports varied, but all newspaper stories hinted at some kind of interaction between the brothers-in-law and co-workers, because they both worked at the brewery, Frank Lamp and Jesse Winkle, in the days leading up to February 22nd, 1907. Winkle quit work at the brewery a few days ago after a quarrel over his work. He had remarked in the presence of witnesses that someone would have to be fixed in order to make things right. As far as the fellow employees of the two men know, there was no quarrel between them that would have reasonably led to murder. And yet, murder was on the horizon, and not too far on the horizon. So let me set this photo for you, or set the scene for you from this photo, 1907, which was taken just a few months after um, the crime. So this photo is looking southwest, and the photographer would have been standing on the hill above what is today I-5, where it crosses the estuary, or the, well, actually Capitol Lake, and heads east towards Lacey. So on the left, you can see the Brew Tower here, and there are two from the west side of the Deschutes River, there were two bridges that led over to the brewery. There's a footbridge and a railroad bridge. And those would be the routes that most people took to work if they lived up on the West Hill, uh, the Tumwater Hill. You can see um, the arrows pointing to the Macintosh house, which is no, no longer there, but the Brewmaster's house, also known as the Henderson house, and the Crosby house, you're probably familiar with those because those historic homes are still there. And in the lower right, we have the Long Bridge to Olympia. So that ran across what was then the estuary and came up the hill um, kind of into the South Capitol District. And in that yellow area, that is pointing to those piles of lumber that we saw in a, the previous photo. Um, and that's an important location. So um, Frank Lamp and his family lived west west of and uphill from the brewery. To get to work, Frank walked downhill to what was then known as Reserve Street, which is pretty much days Deschutes away, and he crossed over to the water on the brewery, to the brewery on either the footbridge or the railroad bridge. He had no reason to use the long bridge because that only went to Olympia. So Frank worked the night shift at the brewery, and one night he on February 22nd, he was heading towards the brewery to go to work, and it was 11 p.m., so it was dark out. He carried a lunchbox, lunchbox and an orange in his pocket. Lamp appeared to be expecting trouble for some time past. He bought a revolver and had been in the habit of carrying it up to the night of his death. What a few days earlier his wife questioned him as to the reason why he was going armed, he told her that things were not looking all right at the brewery. Co-workers had been ribbing Lamp about carrying a gun around, so he responded to the ribbing by leaving the gun at work on his previous shift. So on the night of February 22nd, when he was coming to work, he did not have a gun on him. Just after 11 p.m., screams and calls for help were heard near the south end of the Long Bridge, about where that 
yellow box is pointing to. Responding to the cries were a brewery employer employee and a mail carrier in the area, they were soon joined by brewery manager Peter G. Schmidt and two others who lived nearby. They found Frank Lamp lying near a lumber pile about 40 feet from the south end of the Long Bridge in a space of 10 feet square painted with blood and Lamp's clothing was literally soaked in the crimson flood. One of the men later testified, when we reached Lamp, he was still conscious and apparently clear headed. Someone asked him, who did it, Frank? And he replied, Winkle. We raised his head up, and another one of the men, I believe it was Mr. Schmidt, asked him again, and he replied, Winkle. A few seconds later, he said, let me down, fellows, and we lowered his head. He gasped, I'm going now, and he died. Uh, a newspaper story itemized the wounds that Frank had suffered. This is a little grisly, but... Um, there were four deep stab wounds in the region of the heart, any one of which might have produced death, and eight deep wounds in the back, extending down as far as the loins. There were, there were several cuts in the arms and a horrible gash that nearly severed the left thumb. One of the fingers, fingers on the right hand was also completely cut off. There was also a deep cut on one ear and several cuts about the shoulders. One of the cheekbones was bruised as from a heavy blow. The weapon was thought to be a medium or more likely a large pocket knife. What led up to the encounter, no one knows. Lamp was wholly unarmed and had no means other than his own strength to defend him in the unequal struggle against a demon armed with a knife. So when the police arrived at the scene of the murder, they immediately set out to catch Jesse because everyone believed Frank's dying declaration that it was Jesse Winkle who had killed him. Um, they soon found that family members of both assailant and victim were not surprised to learn of the murder. The police set, searched Jesse's home in Olympia and questioned his stepfather, Byers, who had been living with Jesse. Byers said that Winkle had been home at 9 o'clock but left about that time. He feared that his son was going on a drinking spree, so he went uptown and visited all the sal saloons without finding Jesse. Some comment was made on the fact that during the entire search and questioning by the police, Byers did not ask a single question as to why the search was being made or for what Winkle was wanted. Now, if somebody came to your home looking for your, your stepson in connection with whatever, wouldn't you want to know why the police were looking for him? Uh, another mystery is the fact that, oh, wait a minute, I've skipped one here. Another mystery is the fact that Mrs. Lamp, Frank's widow, testified that she heard the cries of the murdered man and did not investigate, even though she thought at the time that they may have been made by her husband. Her stepbrother was with her at the time, and although she testified that she heard someone say, he is killed, they both went back to bed. When the coroner went to the house Saturday morning, several of the neighbors told him to be careful what he said, as she had not been told how Lamp met his death, or who was accused of the crime. Remember, this is her husband who died and her brother who was accused of killing him. However, she knew almost as much about it as the coroner did. So um, in our collection of documents at the Schmidt House, we have a, di a typewritten diary that was kept by some unnamed brewery employee at the time, and he had this pretty pithy description of the week's events mixed in with um, some other just uninteresting things uh, that happened at the brewery. You see on the 21st of February, Winkle quit work. 22nd, Winkle murdered Lamp. That's a bald phrase. And on 26th, did not work, buried Lamp. And even on Frank Lamp's death certificate, um, it officially said, stab wound and heart inflicted by J.H. Winkle. So newspaper uh, articles appeared, obviously, in the local papers all up and down the Washington coast, western Washington, and as far away as California. This was big news. It, uh, the news chased everything else off the front pages, and everyone, newspaper reporters and certainly people that lived around here, were speculating about Jesse's motive for killing Frank because we had some testimony that no one in the brewery really knew why there would have been such bad blood between the brothers-in-law. But the motive soon became clear, and it focused on Susie. Just before the murder, Jesse had written and mailed letters to Susie, his wife, Alice, his sister, 
Peter Schmidt, the manager of the brewery, and the Morning Olympian newspaper. The letters to the newspaper and to his sister Alice were published. So I'm going to give you an abbreviated version here, but we have those, the news of the murder in Jesse's own words. To the Daily Olympian, he wrote, Sirs, please let this letter be known to the world, so it will be a warning to other scoundrels. This man, meaning Frank, has wrecked my happy home and life and myself and dear little baby boy Jim and worst of all, my darling wife whom I love. He has also seduced and brought to ruin three of my dear sisters before they were 14 years of age. And one of them, them named Lucy is at present in a house of ill fame on account of it. My darling wife was a good woman and virtuous until this scoundrel of the blackest color went to my house like a thief in the night and ruined my wife and wrecked my family. My intentions are, before this letter gets in print, to square accounts with this man in a way in which he will never wreck another man's family. The letter to his sister Alice read, To my dear sister, Alice, I have to do this. Frank is a man not fit for you. I have known of his doings for years. I think you are very blind not to know. Alice, he has been having illicit relations, and that's how the newspaper phrased it, illicit relations, with Susie. I hope you will forgive me, but I am going to spoil his life forever, the same as he has mine and yours. I do not want to kill Frank. I do not believe in murder, but I do intend to ruin him for life, the same as he has done to my darling wife, Susie. I would rather see you living in poverty with your good name than to see you living in luxury with a dirty, low-life dog like him. So in these letters, Jesse then confessed his premeditated assault on Frank, but he also said pretty strongly that he did not plan on murdering him, only on emasculation, which was his goal. Um, so the newspapers weren't sure if Jesse was really telling the truth in these letters, but they had a coroner's inquest, and Susie herself got up on the stand and corroborated everything. So a newspaper article wrote, scarcely out of her teens, slight and with a pretty face, Mrs. Winkle seemed almost a girl as she bravely faced the crowd of men who has assembled to listen to the testimony at the inquest. With bowed head and trembling lips and in a sort voice scarcely audible, Mrs. Jesse H. Winkle tonight swept aside all doubt of the motive that prompted her husband to stab to death Frank W. Lamp by confessing to the coroner's jury that she had told Winkle of her shame as she faced him for the last time when driven from their home by his cruel, treat cruel treatment earlier this week. She told without reservation of her intimacy with Lamp and how on her confession Winkle seemed all but crazed by the blow. She said she had confessed and answered questions from her husband that her intimacy with Lamp had extended since, extended since late in August 1906. Although she had feared that Winkle might wreak vengeance upon his brother-in-law, her fears had been lulled by her husband's promise that he would not kill Lamp. She told how she had married Winkle when she was but a little bit more than 16 years old, how their married life had been unpleasant and fa finally unendurable on her part by his abuse and cruelty, how when her little baby was but two months old, Winkle had begun to beat the infant when it cried until she feared for its life. That Winkle did not set out with the intention of killing Lamp is borne out by the letter he wrote to his sister, Lamp's wife, in which he said he simply meant to injure him. This was further brought out by the testimony of Peter Schmidt, one of the proprietors of the brewery where the two men were employed, who said that on the day Winkle quit work, he came to him and said he was going to emasculate the man who had broken up his home. The sheriff offered a reward of $200, which is about $5,500 in today's money, for information on Jesse's whereabouts. And although Jesse's description was sent up and down the coast to different police stations, the murderer had made a clean escape. Now, we heard in one of Jesse's, wink, Jesse's letters that Lamp had, according to Jesse, had seduced and brought to ruin three of my dear sisters before they were 14 years of age, and one of them named Lucy is at present in a house of ill fame on account of it. So the two older sisters, and this is another generic in, image, um, not of the actual uh, sisters here. The two older sisters were living in, married and living in Seattle area, and they both came back to Thurston County when they heard of the murder. And they both strenuously denied having any 
relations with, uh, with Frank, either forced or consensual. Lucy, however, is another story. Lucy Maud was the youngest daughter. And directly after the murder, police were chasing down all gossip about where Jesse might be. So one of the things they heard was that Lucy, his sister, was try knew of Jesse's whereabouts. So they found Lucy living in Seattle in the Idaho house in the restricted area, which was an area of brothels in Seattle. Uh, Lucy also called Maud. Maud Stewart and a friend were arrested here today by the police. The woman is believed to have been in communications with Winkle, who escaped after the crime was committed. The police eventually concluded that Lucy was not in communications with Jesse. She wanted to be helpful to the police and wanted to help find Jesse. So she and her boyfriend were released. But the story she told was that at age 13, she had married a man in Pierce County. 13, even in those days, was pretty young to get married. Um, her husband took her to Skagway, Alaska, and there placed her in a dance hall. Since then, her life has been one of misfortune. So read between the lines there. Uh, was Lucy so desperate to get away from Frank and his predations on her that she ran away and got married with someone who then only made her life worse? Maybe so. Um, under the headline, whoops, under the headline, says brother was justified, Lucy said that Jesse was justified in the killing. If he is ever brought to trial, the story of the crimes he avenged will result in his speedy acquittal. So Lucy was saying that Frank was a bad guy and preyed on her. So Jesse was correct about Frank's abuse, at least with Lucy. So perhaps Jesse's claim about his other sisters were true too. So what was the aftermath of all this for Susie? In August 1907, just six months after the murder, Susie gave birth to a second child. But who was the father of that child? We'll never know. It could have been her husband, Jesse. It could have been um, Frank, because he was having his affair, or, well, consensual or not, with, uh, with Susie at an appropriate time where he could have fathered the child. At any rate, um, the baby was named Clarence, and um, apparently it was a healthy birth. For a while, uh, Susie wanted to get back together with Frank. She hadn't given up on him. She realized that, she, that he had had a legitimate reason in his eyes for killing Frank, even though he had said that he wasn't going to kill him. Um, but she eventually gave up and filed for a divorce from Frank. Uh, in a formal complaint, her attorney wrote that um, Jesse had treated Susie in a cruel and inhuman manner on or about the 21st day of February. He beat her and drove her from her home. Since then, he has abandoned her, provi failed to provide the actual necessities of life, even though he knew, well, knew full well that she was heavy with child and that she would become a mother in August. So the divorce was granted in uh, early 1908. And then, as if that wasn't enough trouble for Susie, just a few months after that, Clarence, the baby, died. He was only 14 months old, and he died of tubercular men meningitis. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that is, but other than it's a swelling of the meninges around the, um, around the brain. So he was buried in the Bush Prairie Cemetery. And just a few months after this, Susie became embroiled in another a really bizarre story. Uh, I call this one a doppelganger because, well, you'll see why. It's the term for twin. In early 1909, a man named James Wheelahan, oddly enough with the same initials as Jesse Winkle, was arrested in San Francisco for burglary. The San Francisco police had, a couple years before, gotten a uh, circular or flyer about Jesse Winkle because the sheriff here in Thurston County sent his description out to all the police stations up and down the West Coast. So the San Francisco police arrested this guy named James Wheelahan and realized that they, after they looked through their old um, warrants and whatnot that he bore a strong resemblance to Jesse Winkle. 
So they forwarded photos of the suspect to the Thurston County Sheriff, and the likeness was so pronounced that, that further marks were looked up and a tattoo design on the breast of the man in the San Francisco jail corresponded to one of those that Jesse was said to wear. So Sheriff George Gaston, who was sheriff at the time, and Thurston County prosecuting attorney John Wilson agreed that the San Francisco police probably had Jesse in custody. So the sheriff got extradition papers and he traveled down to San Francisco and returned with Wheelahan. And they started calling him Wheelahan slash Winkle. When they arrived in Olympia, some people who had known Jesse got a quick glimpse of this guy before he was put in jail. And they said, that's not Jesse. It looks kind of like him, but it's not Jesse. But the sheriff was convinced that he had him because he had enough um, marks uh, uh, scars and whatnot, um, tattoos, that he was equally confident that he had the right man. Um, but a newspaper wrote, the prisoner, if he be Winkle, has evidently succeeded in working out an exceptionally clever disguise. Not only has his hair been changed many shades darker, but his very complexion seems to be much darker. It is said that even his jaws are heavier, and in fact, a number of differences are claimed by those who saw him as he was rushed to the jail. Adolf Schmidt, who was chief engineer at the brewery, and his brother Leo had worked closely with Jesse, and they testified that this man was not Jesse Winkle. But the sheriff thought he knew better, even though the sheriff at that time had never seen Jesse Winkle in person. Um, so Wilson and Gaston began, began gathering more evidence. They interviewed many of Winkle's family and former acquaintances to look learn about distinguishing marks like tattoos and scars um, so that they compare to compare them on their prisoner. Two local doctors and a dentist were then called into the sheriff's office and they brought Wheelahan slash Winkle in and they had a list of marks, scars, tattoos, and even though the results of the exam weren't made public, the sheriff and the attorney came away thinking even more so that they had uh, Jesse in their hands. So um, Wilson and Gaston also asked the Winkle family members, it seems like a no-brainer, and uh, other acquaintances to meet Will Wheelahan face-to-face -face and say, is this Jesse or not? Um, Susie, of course, was high on the list. And by this time, Susie, not only was she dealing with all this, the death of her child, her younger son, she also had contracted con tuberculosis, and she wasn't expected to live for long. Um, in those days, TB was often a fatal disease. Um, so she finally um, agreed to see the prisoner, and she did. She was brought into the jail and agreed to see him, and she insisted confidently that that was not her husband, Jesse. This is somebody else, looks a little bit like my ex-husband, that is not Jesse. And other relatives of, Frank, of Jesse's frankly refused to have anything to do with the case. So this is the uh, Thurston County Jail and Courthouse where um, Wheelahan was imprisoned. So Wheelahan maintained that he was not Winkle, but he said in kind of a joking manner. In fact, he treated the whole thing like it was a big farce. He said that he had served in both the US Army and the Navy during the years 06 and 07, which is when we know Jesse Winkle was up here working at the brewery. Um, so he thought he had an ironclad alibi, but a search of military records going back several years found no Wheelahan on any re records from San Francisco or the, or the surrounding area. Um, by the end of May, uh, newspapers were predicting that Wheelahan would have to be let go because there wasn't enough evidence to convict him, no hard evidence. The sheriff was still convinced that he had the murder in custody. He cited the number of scars that were found during the physical exam. Susie Winkle told me that on the right leg, four inches above the knee, was a scar that was made by being cut with the barrel hoop. That scar is on the man who says his name is Wheelahan. A scar was found close to Wheelahan's right shoulder blade, and was, when Mrs. Winkle was asked if her former husband had such a scar on his back, she described it in the location and said it was a result of a knife wound that he had received in a fight at Bremerton. Jesse Winkle had a scar over the left eye where he was kicked in a fight. The alleged Wheelahan has a scar in the same spot. Jesse Winkle had a scar on the bridge of his nose where he was hit with a beer bottle. Wheelahan has the same scar. So this is starting to sound pretty conclusive here. Um, so affidavits were eventually taken from Susie, 
from a Tumwater postmaster who was also a shirt tail relative of Winkle, a local barber who had shaved both men, a man who knew Wheelahan from the army in California, and two men who knew Wheelahan as a, a soldier elsewhere. All of these witnesses swore that Wheelahan was not Jesse Winkle. So the prosecuting attorney finally gave up and said, okay, we have no, uh, not enough hard evidence, even though the sheriff and I think, still think it's the guy. Um, so after two months in the Thurston County Jail, they finally had to reduce or release Wheelahan. Then and only then did he declare, my real name is John Preston. Why he didn't give this up <laughs> to begin with, God only knows. Maybe he said, my right name is John Randolph Preston, and that is the name under which I served in the Army. So they did let him, indeed let him go. And with the correct name in hand, I was able to find his service record. And the authorities at that time were able to find it too, under the name Preston. So, so they proved that military records from 1906 and 07 contained a photo, which I wish I had, uh, but a complete physical description of Preston, including his many scars and tattoos. These corresponded precisely with what the doctors had found on Preston's, well, Wheelahan slash Winkle slash Preston. Um, so why he didn't trot out his real name beforehand, I don't know. Maybe he liked jail food. Uh, but Jesse Winkle was described in a sheriff's notice as age 26, 5 feet 9 to 10 inches tall, hair very curly, light brown, weight 160 to 165, tattoo mark on the hand or wrist, large American flag tattooed on the breast. Wheelahan in some of these records was described as age 26, blue eyes, dark brown hair, dark complexion, 5 feet 9 inches. And he also had almost identical scars. So local newspapers claim that that whole affair would go down <clears throat> as one of the strangest cases of mistaken identity in police annals. So back to Susie, our continuing thread through this story. Um, was she happy at last? We hope so. The bluebird of happiness had not lit on her doorstep very often. But she was, at this point in her life, only 24 years old. She had already undergone an abusive early childhood, an abusive marriage, a forced or consensual extramarital relationship, abandonment by her, her husband, the notoriety of the murder and the whole public confessions, the death of her younger son, involvement in the whole doppelganger affair, and she was still suffering from tuberculosis. So by any standards, she was due a little bit of happiness. So news articles later stated that Susie had met a man named Fred Gilmore on a trip to Grangeville, Idaho, uh, which is, I'll show you a map here in a second, uh, presumably in a trip that she took there in 1909. Perhaps they met while Susie was visiting relatives in the Coeur d'Alene area. Perhaps they knew each other as children because Fred Gilmore had grown up in the Tumwater, was born and, and raised in his first few years in Tumwater. At any rate, Susie and Fred got married in 1909 in Grangeville. So um, Fred was, although he was born in Tumwater, his older brothers, much older brothers, had migrated to Grangeville, Idaho, which is the uh, star on the left up there on the Idaho map. And they, uh, the brothers had a ranch out in the wilderness about 30 miles east of Grangeville. And that's where um, Fred and Susie went to live. They uh, had a land claim, and the claim was described as being a, in a very rugged and isolated section of the country, accessible only by a mountain trail. And on this uh, map over here, you can see where the Gilmore Ranch is called out with a star, and it is indeed pretty rugged uh, country. We don't have a description of Susie's married life, but we can hope that she finally found some peace and some happiness there. She had a new husband who, there are no accounts of his mistreating her anyway. She still had her older son, James, and she had a home in the pristine wilderness. So we hope she was happy, but if so, it was pretty short-lived happiness because she still had TB. Um, at that time, while she was not in the best of health, it was thought a change of climate and the pure mountain air would prove beneficial. Fred, her new husband, must have really been devoted to her because he married her, despite her rather tenuous health situation. So by early 1910, Susie's TB had worsened. All was done that was in the 
was within the power of friends and relatives, but the disease had made such inroads that the case was hopeless. In addition, Fred's wilderness home was 30 miles from the nearest doctor. So on February 19, 1910, Susie died. And that was just four months after her marriage. Um, she died of TB at her husband's ranch. She was not quite 25. She and Fred must have discussed um, her wishes, her last wishes, because he went to extraordinary efforts to get her body back to Olympia, back to, well, actually back to Tumwater. Uh, and we'll hear about that in a minute. She apparently wanted to, I'm assuming here, that she wanted to be buried next to her son Clarence, who was in the Bush Prairie Cemetery. So from, these are from newspaper reports. From his ranch, Fred carried the body in his arms through the worst storm of the winter to the home of a neighbor three miles away. It took almost a day to accomplish this, and then he was forced to wait for three days at the neighbor's house on account of the storm. By the time Fred and his neighbors could start out again, the body was frozen stiff, and friends volunteered to carry it to Mount Idaho on a litter. This was found impossible on account of the deep snow. Accordingly, the body was lashed on a horse. The men in the party with Mr. Gilmore took turns in breaking the trail for the horse with the body, and after five days traveling, they reached Grangeville. Once they got to town, Susie's body was embalmed, and, it, and then Fred and... Uh, Fred took his wife's body on a train headed toward Olympia and Tumwater. They arrived here on March 3rd, and Susie was buried there in Bush Prairie Prim Cemetery next to her son Clarence. Um, after, I found, after I wrote the story um, it, that appeared in the Thur Thurston County Historical Journal, I was contacted by a shirt relative of Fred Gilmore, and I was told about this book, and he sent me a copy, uh, loaned me a copy. And the book was written 90 years, almost 90 years after um, Susie died, but it had a, just a few paragraphs about Fred's wife. And it was full of misinformation, um, but Regardless of that, and it was all based on, on um, family stories, and you know how family stories can morph over the years. But regardless of that, this photograph that appeared in the book was said to, this is indeed Fred, but that photograph was claimed to be Fred with Susie's body over the horse. If that is true, then that is the only photo we have of Susie Lewis. The rest of the book is because it has such misinformation about Susie. In fact, it called her, the book called her Janet. Um, um, I hesitate to say how good the rest of the book was. Um, so Susie's misfortune seemed to affect the rest of her family even more so, I think, than, I mean, you, you can imagine that with every large family, there's going to be a lot of misfortune. I mean, nobody dies healthy, but still, uh, her family seems to have been affected even more. Her older son, James, um, was living at uh, Fred, with Fred Gilmore in Idaho at their ranch for a little while, but eventually, I suppose, um, again, maybe Fred thought that that wasn't the best in, environment for a child, or he felt that was too far from... Uh, civilization to raise a child. So he sent or took uh, James as a youngster back to live with Jesse's half brother, uh, Walter, who at the time lived in uh, Kitsap County. Um, so that's where James grew up. And he died in 1921 near Seattle from tubercular meningitis, the same uh, uh, thing, the same death cause that his much younger brother Clarence died with a long time ago. So James was only 17 when he passed away. So Fred Gilmore, even though he was only 26 when Susie died, never married again. And he lived out his life mostly at the ranch up in the mountains of Idaho, but then eventually went into Grangeville and died when he was about 84. Um, the Gilmore Ranch still exists and is and shows up on maps, um, and is kind of a, a base for big game hunts. Um, Alice Winkle Lamp remarried after Frank passed away, and she and her new husband had a couple children of their. She had, I think, four children before 
that she'd had with Frank, and then with her new husband, she had four more children. The family eventually lived up near uh, Lake Washington. And in 1918, Alice sent two of her sons, aged five and seven, out to gather some grass for their chicken, for their chicken, uh, the chicken uh, coop and whatnot. So the boys were supposed to go out on this errand, but instead they decided to play on a log raft in the lake, and they both drowned. Walter Byers, who was um, Jesse Winkle's half-brother and who helped raise James, eventually returned to Olympia from Kitsap County, and he worked at the Olympia Brewery, but he died at um, age 50. He was only 50, and he had heart problems. And even in those days, in the 1930s, that seems uh, pretty early to have passed away. Lucy Young Winkle Byers Ramsdale was Jesse's biological mother, and she remarried once more to this man named Ramsdale. And she moved around Washington quite a bit, and she ended up um, as an older woman in Oregon. She was committed to the Oregon State Hospital, which was a psychiatric hospital, and she died there in 1931. Her body was cremated. Uh, that's what state hospitals did with most of their um, deceased residents if there was no one to claim their body. Her ashes are still at the hospital because no one has ever claimed her ashes. Uh, so Lucy, um, Jesse's half-sister, who apparently was abused by Frank, um, and again, this is a generic image. We don't have any photos of Lucy. She had the one who had been arrested in 1907 um, because the police suspected that she knew where Jesse was. Um, she and her boyfriend at the time, Frame, were married, and they moved to Port Angeles. By 1918, Frame was serving with the military in Alaska, but Lucy stayed in Port Angeles. The next mention of Frame is his death certificate. He died in 1925 in the Northern State Hospital in Cedar Woolley, which is also a psychiatric hospital. He died of general paralysis of the insane. He was listed at the time as single, a single man, I was unable to find Lucy in any other records from uh, actually from 1918 on. So I don't know if she left him, abandoned him, divorced him, if he divorced her, if she remarried or if she went back to a life of prostitution. She just disappears from all the records. So uh, that's an unknown. And what happened to Jesse after he absconded from Tumwater, after he killed Frank Lamp? He was never heard from again. No appearance in any newspaper stories that I was able to find, um, nothing under any of the cemeteries, and the bulk of cemeteries in the US have now been uh, digitized, their burials have been digitized and are available on cemetery websites, but nothing under his name or derivations of his name, so he's gone. And finally, what happened to the main thread in our story, Susie Lewis Winkle Gilmore? We know that she was brought back, her body was brought back to Bush Prairie Cemetery and was buried alongside Clarence, her baby. But what happened then? There are, there are some sketch maps of the cemetery and some say roughly where, the, uh, where Susie might have been buried, but did she ever get any gravestones? I don't know, there's nothing there now. So if there were any gravestones or even wooden markers, they, along with Susie, have been lost to the vagaries of time. Thank you. So, do we have time for questions? Yeah. Okay, anybody have any questions? Yeah. Bush Prairie Cemetery, where's that look? Hold on, I'm gonna give oh. you the mic. Thank you. Yeah, she's gonna have you use the microphone because otherwise the people on Zoom won't be able to hear you. Bush Prairie Cemetery, where is that located? Where is it? It's just, do you know where Mills and Mills uh, funeral parlor is across from Costco, that area in Tumwater. Yeah, yes. part of that cemetery is the Bush Prairie uh, Cemetery. It's now called Union, the Union Cemetery. So, uh, and some people call it still the, the Pioneer or Union Pioneer Cemetery. So that's where it is. That's where George Bush is buried. Um, so it's right across the street from, from Costco and, and uh, Walmart there in Tumwater. Yeah. Anything else? Any questions from uh, 
from the Zoom people, if there are any Zoom people out there? We don't have any questions online yet, but sometimes it takes them a little while to get revved up. So I have a question in the meantime. (laughs) (laughs) I always like to ask, you know, how you got interested in this. What was the spark that kind of made you like dig right into this? Uh, Yeah, good question. Um, Some of you probably have heard of Don Trosper. He's uh, written a lot of... um, short stories and whatnot over the years. And he did, several years ago, he did a a very short story about Susie Lewis and Jesse. Actually, it was mostly about, it wasn't about Susie. It was about the Jesse Winkle and Frank Lamp murder. And um, he stopped at when Frank was murdered, and he never went any farther. Um, And to me, all you had to do was almost literally turn the page of the newspaper because... Two days later, they were talking about the motive, which was Frank's abuse of Susie. Um, So I knew that much, but I put it aside for quite a while. And then I was asked by the city of Tumwater to do some research on burials in the the, uh, Bush Prairie Cemetery. And while doing that, I ran across, well, I was dealing with some maps of the cemetery and also looking through the newspapers of the day for people who were buried there. And I ran across this lady named Susie Gilmore. And it might have, somehow it had her maiden name in there. It was actually her first married name. So it was Susie Winkle Gilmore. I said, well, I know her. There's, so this is the end of the story or almost the end of the story. So that prompted me to to go through and really try to tell the whole story. Um, And I should mention that if you want to pick up a copy of the Thurston County Historical Journal that's available in the back, um, that contains a much fuller version of this talk because it has the full text of Jesse's letters to the newspaper, or that were published in the newspaper. And it goes through um, a lot of extra details, which I just didn't have time for because now we're out of time almost. Um, So I shortened it up somewhat for tonight's talk. Um, You can also find that if you like to read things online, you can also go to the City of Lacey website and just look up TCHJ, Thurston County Historical Journal, and you can read the story online too. But if you like paper, they're back there. We do have a question. Okay. We've also had multiple comments of people saying how great this was. So thank you, Karen. Um, So Janine asks, do you think this was a terribly unusual story from this period? Weren't there a lot of pretty rough treatment and abuse of women by men married or otherwise? Well, yes, I suppose there were, just like there are today. But um, in those days, women, well, as again, as they are today, some of them anyway, were probably more reluctant to talk about it. This one, just because of the, the public and sensational nature of the murder, got into the news. So if Jesse hadn't murdered Frank, would any of that had become known? I kind of doubt it. I don't know that Susie would have run around confessing that she had been abused by Frank Lamp. Um, obviously, Jesse's sisters had already been married, and they weren't eager to talk about it. So I'm not sure that this is... Um, that that was unusual for those days. It probably isn't unusual for these days, but it got talked about. It made the papers. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Last call for online questions. All right. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming tonight, you and the Zoom attendees too. Thank you.